of time and dollars that have paved the way for mission uh, through service and evangelism in this diocese of Texas. We give you thanks for the clergy, uh, the deacons and priests and bishops who have gone before us, but most of all for the lay people, those who have kept the church alive at the hardest of times so that today we may enjoy uh, with great gratitude the mercy of your everlasting hope for our continued community. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Okay, Texas. So the first, the way in which the Episcopal Church came to Texas is by lay people. So they were part of the Western kind of Scottish, Irish, American movement into Texas from the East. That probably there were a few deacons that came and settled in Texas, but at that point, uh, there was no uh, actual, uh, there were no churches. Now, there's a big argument in our diocese about who the first church is, uh, and we'll touch on that in, in, just, in just a second. Uh, Texas uh, was uh, a republic, a foreign country to the Episcopal Church, and the Episcopal Church had a big debate and general convention about how it would undertake foreign missions. And believe it or not, uh, Texas was one of the three foreign missions chosen by the Episcopal Church uh, to send missionaries to. And so the uh, dude's like, okay, I'm gonna have this problem. <laughs> so I can come out, but I can't go wide. Is what you're telling. Yeah, that's about it. Do this. Everybody online, how about that? How close can I get? Yeah, you can go all the way. I can go all the way. <laughs> like that? Yeah, that's good. Hey! <laughs> <laughs> Happy Sunday! Uh, this is my first church back, you see, so I'm like ready to go. I've got way more energy than you're going to be able to put out there today. So, uh, uh, where was I? So, first foreign, we were one of the first three foreign missions of the Episcopal Church. I'm pretty sure, we would like to say, that they still think we're a foreign mission. Now, the, uh, they appointed and paid for a missionary bishop. In the Episcopal tradition, mission is always accompanied with the Episcopate. It certainly happens because lay people undertake the work along with clergy, but for the Episcopal Church, as in part of the Anglican Communion, it always happens because there's a bishop there to oversee the mission, which is really important. Our first bishop was Leonidas, or Leonidas, however you want to pronounce it, Polk, who later became a Confederate general. Now, and you'll see Polk Street in Houston and all, I mean, he was a pretty famous Southern. And he, uh, was, he was an Episcopalian, he became the first mission bishop, and he would, he was in the station of Louisiana, and he would travel over to visit the congregations, uh, along, mostly along the east side, way up in San Augustine, um, and way down in the Galveston area, and over to uh, Matagor. We had kind of these communities, you didn't have churches yet, but you had these communities. Right? Well, as soon as Texas became uh, uh, a part of the Union, uh, then George Washington Freeman was appointed uh, the bishop. It was under Freeman that we have our first church that's formally organized, which is Matagorda. Now, San Augustine will tell you they were first. Nacogdoches will tell you they were first. But Matagorda is our mother church. So they may have been doing church, but Matagorda was the first one to officially form. Uh, as an Episcopal, as an Episcopal congregation. And you can go to Matagorda today, you can go see, I think it's the third church uh, uh, of the mother churches because the other ones got washed away by hurricanes. Uh, and they, they had to rebuild a couple of times. One, of, one time it literally just floated down the street. Now, uh, the, the diocese begins to grow, it's pretty small. You have uh, Trinity in Galveston. Uh, you have uh, some congregations beginning to form in the San Antonio area, uh, but there's not a lot going on. Uh, I think when the first diocesan council, missionary council, is formed, uh, there are somewhere like eight congregations 
of which half couldn't get there because it was too muddy. So the, about half of them met and formed themselves officially as the Missionary Diocese of Texas. And this included all of Texas, okay? Uh, and it also included kind of in the North Texas area, if you look at one of the early maps in our, in our archives, you'll see it says Indian Territory. So it included that kind of uh, Indian Territory up north as well. And uh, Texas decides that they will elect their first uh, bishop. And the first bishop, official diocesan bishop of the Diocese of Texas, is Alexander Gregg. He was the fifth person to be asked to be bishop. <laughs> so he's, he's the one who said yes. So he, he comes uh, to Texas uh, and um, uh, begins to uh, plant churches, uh, and uh, he and, and he serves. He ends up serving for 34 uh, years. Uh, during his time period, that Indian territory in Texas becomes much more formed uh, as part of the state, and uh, they uh, divided the two. Air, the rest of the state up. So at that point, the state of Texas becomes divided between the Diocese of Texas, which is us. That's Houston, Austin, uh, Waco, Tyler, Clean, Orange. Right? So those would be like the points on the map. And then the Mission District of West Texas at San Antonio and further west. And the Mission District of North Texas, which is all of that and so his area got shrunk, but he also begins to grow churches. What's interesting about this, and I had never really thought about this until I did some of my own study, is that you know churches come and go. We've had over 45 other churches that don't even exist anymore, and towns and schools and all kinds of things. And part of what is helpful to think about, I think, in terms of our own history is that uh, church planting has always been an important part, mission has always been an important part. Serving the community has been important, as has evangelism. But there's also times and seasons for churches. <laughs> uh, and I think coming out of the 1960s, we kind of just thought churches would be around forever. But, but the truth is, in Texas, we actually have this long history of churches popping up with towns and then going away. Right? When the town doesn't exist anymore. There are a lot of Texas towns that don't exist anymore where there was a church. And so Greg goes around and is planting these churches um, he's going to be the first uh, person to uh, 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 create, if you will, um, a sense of life in the diocese as a whole. He's a very strong bishop. Um, and uh, I brought uh, with me show and tell. This is his staff, which I carry everywhere I go. Every diocesan bishop has carried this. This was given to him right when he called for a coadjutor, for he called for his replacement at council in 1891 here in Austin. That's where the council was held, and the clergy presented him with this. All the, all the gold pieces are original. The wood, this, I think it's probably the fourth version of wood that we've, we've had on here. So, uh, uh, and it's, you can barely see the inscription, but I'm going to put it up here for you all to look at. Uh, in a few minutes while we do q and I'd pass it around. It's really heavy, um, and I don't want anybody to knock themselves in the head with it, which I, it took a while to figure that out. Uh, uh, I might be dense. It might have taken too long, actually. How many times was I going to hit my head with the top of the crozier before I learned not to hold it that way? Is, yes? Is that gold? It's gold-plated. So you can see where the altar guild gave me this really nice, this, like, Bishop, don't touch that with the hand. I'm like every bishop's touched this, so I'm gonna. Like, and I have a, I have a terrible habit of holding it like this, right where the inscription is, and I also have a terrible habit of spinning it. It's not a terrible habit; I just like spinning. Bishop Quinn used to ride it around, make people laugh. So it's you know it's it's had its own seasons and times, but the altar guild doesn't like it because I'm supposed to keep it all nice and polished and probably wear white gloves, which I don't do. Now, a uh, quick story. Oh, gosh, it's too much. I'm not going to make it. 
Uh, quick story, Bishop Greg was held up by Jesse James coming out of San Antonio. And uh, this, is, this is a, a story and, uh, that's it's, uh, recorded in several history books. He came out of San Antonio with a big bankroll to pay his clergy. And uh, 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 he's held up by Jesse James. And they take that big wad of cash and they take this woman's purse and take everything. And Jesse James says, Pastor, you need to hand me that watch. And, and, and he had a big chain, gold watch in his pocket. Oh, no watch. And uh, he said, well, that was given to me by my clergy. And so Jesse James supposedly stood back and said, why, this woman over here has given all that she has, Bishop. <laughs> and here you're holding on to that gold watch. So he gave him the gold watch. And as he rode away, legend has it, he said, even the devil can quote scripture. <laughs> so, uh, can solving. Uh, the way, they didn't have suffragan bishops back in that day. They didn't have assistant bishops. You elected your successor when you were ready. So they elect, in 1891, he calls for the election of a coadjutor. And they elect a person by the name of George Consolving known as Texas George, giant man, evidently. I mean, like six and a half feet. The confirmands would tell you that when he laid his hands, his hands would cover the heads of the people, just the two hands. They were so huge. Uh, and so they, uh, the House of Bishops nicknamed him Texas George. And uh, he would continue this missionary uh, effort. Now, under him, two really important institutions come up. So if, imagine now that we're thinking a little bit about who we are today. We are a diocese of mission that, that seeks uh, to serve God through evangelism and through service to others, right? And solving creates two important institutions, which gives us another piece of who we are as a diocese of Texas. He founds uh, both the dorm, consolving dorm at UT, as a women's dormitory, and uh, All Saints Episcopal Chapel on the campus of UT. So he understands the importance of campus mission, uh, and he will also begin Rice uh, Autry House as a campus mission. So he had uh, a real desire to teach young people about the Episcopal Church, and gives us this sense that that campus ministry and young people and young adults are an important part of who we are as us, and an important place in which we should do the work of evangelism and service as well, right? So those are, those are kind of the big pieces. Now, consolving, you served until your death. So uh, Greg served till his death. Consolving served till his death. I'm hoping to serve as long as consolving so that I can do what he did, which was he didn't go to council anymore. He was, I say, this year, dear friends at council, this year I made one visitation <laughs> to visit my people in ex congregation, but I have taken to my bed over this weekend and cannot be with you. You are in good hands with Bishop Quinn. And so that's my goal is kind of reach a point. It doesn't have to be before my death or even before my retirement. I just kind of want to send a letter to everybody and say, yeah, you all do council without me. <laughs> like, you, I trust you all to take up the business without me. I've, I've taken to my upstairs, as they say. Now, um, so that's Bishop Consolving, and, and where we are in terms of time, that's where I get confused, I have to kind of look at my notes here, is about the early 20th century, right? So uh, in 1918, uh, uh, Consolving calls for the election of his coadjutor, the person who is going to take his place. And that per person is Clinton S. Quinn. And Quinn is uh, the uh, rector at this time. So all the other bishops have come from elsewhere. But Quinn is the first rector inside the diocese to be elected. And he is serving at uh, Trinity Church on Holman in Midtown Houston at the time. And he was crazy. Uh, 
he had uh, a fight with his vestry, told him he needed a new parish hall with a basketball court in it for the youth of the area. And the vestry wouldn't give it to him. So he started holding uh, Sunday school classes and church outside on the street and in the lawn in the rain and in the snow. Probably not snow, it's Houston, uh, right? But he basically shamed the vestry into giving him the parish hall, which stands today. So he was a little cantankerous sort. Now, he was a big institutional person. Of course, you think about that early builder generation. I mean, he's, he, he is the one who leads us through uh, the smallpox pandemic. He leads us through uh, a time of great change in our cities as Texas begins to grow, uh, substantially grow. Uh, he will... Uh, he, he organizes an ecumenical movement to provide the first women's shelter, now the Star of Hope in Houston. Uh, he, uh, is a, he organized a citywide baseball uh, league uh, for, uh, for young boys. Uh, he is the one who helps to create Camp Allen on the bay, but also begins to plant camps all across the diocese so that by the time we get to the 1960s we actually have six camps in the diocese of texas he's the one who started the uh, uh saint luke's episcopal uh, hospital in houston uh, he went into uh um oh, i forget i forget his name he went in and basically said i heard you gave a million dollars to to Methodist Hospital, why don't you give a million dollars to Episcopalians to start a hospital? And so then he matched that million dollars by doing a diocesan-wide campaign. So they took two million dollars and built St. Luke's uh, Hospital. So you know, I mean, and, and the churches are growing. And we have growing churches, and we have more churches. And so during this time period, we we reach about sixty congregations. What do you think that's that's actually a sizable? That's about the size of the diocese of West Texas today. So it grew substantially, if you can think about those 20 and 30 early ones under Consolving and Greg to this much larger footprint in the diocese uh, of, of Texas. So you can go around the diocese and you can tell which churches were planted uh, during these time periods because both George and Quinn were a large uh, people. Um, the other piece is that uh, two important churches were founded, St. James and St. Martin's, uh, Houston. So there, there's also a, a move to plant, um, well underway, to plant black congregations. Uh, we don't have any Spanish-speaking congregations at this point, uh, but there is a sense that we need to be broadening our uh, mission uh, footprint. Now, in... 1945, John Hines is elected as our coadjutor, and Quinn and John Hines did not like each other. And so basically, Quinn began to hand things over to John uh, and to Hines, and they kind of ran two separate dioceses, <laughs> if you will. Uh, and Quinn began to, to fade away. Quinn would be... Uh, um, would retire. He'd be the first bishop to retire in an office in the Diocese of Texas. And I actually have a picture uh, that was signed by him after they created the church pension fund and mandatory retirement. And uh, at the bottom it says it's got his name. And he gave this to a friend, which made it to the hands of John Logan, which made it to my hands. Uh, and it says Clinton S. Quinn. Uh, uh, OPB, one pissed off bishop, because he had expected he had expected to retire, uh, to not retire, to work forever. So he had this mandatory retirement. So he retires. He's, you know, he just kind of ends his days very frustrated. Now, what's interesting about that is uh, the family of uh, Quinn held on to his cross and gave it to me. Uh, to wear. So this is Clinton S. Quinn's pectoral cross, uh, which is just a huge gift, uh, in part because I think he represents for the people of the Diocese of Texas, and it's a passing generation right now, but really and truly represents 
kind of the missionary mindset. Uh, uh, we began to grow campus missions and churches, and it just really... John Hines is often credited as the great missionary bishop of the diocese. The truth is that he's uh, on, bookended on both sides but by bishops who believed in planting churches, both Quinn and Richardson. Okay. Now, uh, John serves for not very long in the scheme of things. You think about all of these bishops, they've served 30... 20, 38 years, 35 years, 34 years. John Hines only serves 19 uh, years because he's elected to be presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church. And he is one of the first bishops. It used to be that bishops, the presiding bishop was simply the bishop with seniority in the House of Bishops. But they changed, and John Hines would be the first bishop to uh, one of the first bishops to be, I think he was maybe the second or third, to actually be elected presiding bishop. He also would be the first bishop to inhabit the Episcopal uh, offices at 815 in New York City. So um, an important person. He was a very big uh, a proponent for civil rights, uh, planted churches. They say he was the most noted bishop uh, Ever in our history, he had a note in every bank uh, across the Diocese of Texas. Um, he started the Seminary of the Southwest in Austin, St. Vincent's House, uh, St. James House, a retirement community that we had for a while, uh, and uh, certainly led uh, through the Vietnam era uh, along with uh, the great racial divide of that time period. He leaves in 1964, and Milton Richardson... Uh, comes in 1965. Now, Quinn had come from Trinity Midtown. Both Hines and Richardson were dean of the cathedral at the time that they were elected. So Richardson has been the dean of the cathedral, Christ Church. Uh, and, and in fact, Hines, we didn't have a cathedral. We're a pretty low church diocese overall. And so uh, the uh, cathedral itself became a cathedral under Hines. It was, so he was elected from Christ Church Parish but made that the cathedral in Houston, and then Richardson was elected uh, from there. He paid down all of John Hines' debt. Uh, he would be, um, uh, he, he allowed Curcio to come into the diocese, those of you who know that particular renewal movement. He did not like the 1979 prayer book. And they say he was the, the only bishop in the House of Bishops that voted against the 79 prayer book. Now, he also then let everybody use the prayer book. I mean, he, he was, I think Richardson, for me, uh, models that sense of we might disagree, but we're going to still be part of the family, <laughs> right? In other words, that, that I'm going to vote how I'm going to vote, but I'm still a member of the church, and, and, uh, whether you like that or not. And I think that he models that sense that we can actually be together even when we disagree. And not everybody immediately used the 79 prayer book. He let a lot of congregations continue to use the 1928 prayer book. We still have six congregations in the diocese that use the 28 prayer book, with my permission. So uh, I, I think he, he not only led by planting churches, paying down John's debt, uh, John Hines' debt, uh, he also uh, had this sense um, uh, of... Um, uh, getting along, uh, he believed in the Episcopal Church. And at that time, the many Diocese of Texas people helped to run the wider General Convention uh, finance office and other things. So we were still very much a part of this. He would be the first bishop to ordain a woman uh, in the Diocese of Texas. Uh, the rumor is that his uh, wife wanted him to ordain women earlier and that he wouldn't do that. Um, he, he eventually ordained uh, Betty Mascalette. So that was a big, a big change. There was one person who stood up uh, during the ordination, and he, had this, he, he was from Atlanta originally, and uh, he had this very deep, a lot of people will remember Richardson for his voice if you talk to somebody who was around at that time, because he would, uh, we'll use the same confirmation prayer today that he, he would say, more and more. He had this real deep southern draw. And so the, a, a person stood up at council, I mean, at the uh, ordination of 
uh, Betty Mascolette and went to have this big speech about how he didn't believe women should be priests. And uh, Bishop Richardson, to his credit, let him continue all of that and then said, I have come today to ordain Miss Mascolette. We shall proceed. So uh, I, I, what I would say about that, and I think, again, uh, some, I mean, I really, I think Richardson, if you kind of spend any time in this, Richardson is most kind of unlooked at, unexamined bishop. Uh, but he continued the, the tradition of very strong bishops in this, in this diocese. Now along comes Bishop Benitez, uh, and he would be known for continuing uh, the uh, ordination of women. He would not only continue uh, with Curcio, he would allow Faith Alive to come into the diocese. Big renewal bishop, uh, also wanted liturgical renewal early in his career. Uh, wanted, uh, took on the 79 prayer book, kind of leans into that, uh, uh, very big on uh, music, new music for churches, but he also plants El Buen Samaritano, is planted during his tenure, uh, and um, he uh, created the Episcopal Foundation of Texas. So he, that was one of the things. He was a big uh, stewardship person, uh, and really the diocese, even though his tenure goes from that 1970s uh, period of time, I'm sorry, 1980 uh, to uh, 1995, his tenure, uh, while kind of, you all remember that, some of you remember that time period economically, the diocese actually did really well during that time period. Through his guidance, he made sure churches didn't go under during the economic crisis of the time things like that. So uh, for me, I think Ben modeled a couple of things. One is the care of clergy. Uh, Quinn had modeled kind of the care of clergy families. Bishop Benita has really modeled uh, care for uh, the clergy. Uh, and, and this sense that mission is, is diverse, as he was the first one to plant Spanish-speaking congregations. So he helped us kind of grab a hold of that. And then along came, and he served for about 15 years. Bishop Payne came after that. Um, he had the big vision, maintenance, not mission. Uh, he expanded Camp Allen, continued to grow St. Luke's Hospital. Uh, uh, and, and during that time, we were having the great kind of social sexuality debates. And he wouldn't let us talk about it. It's really interesting. Benitez only wanted to talk about it. Uh, but Claude said we couldn't talk about it. So Claude was trying to capture some of that Quinn Richardson stuff, right? To say, look, we're going to stay together as a family and just move through this. And we're not going to talk about it. <laughs> I mean, like, we'd have conventions where he would shut it down when people tried to talk about it. I mean, it was really clear that that wasn't going to happen. Wimberley came along in 2003, so Claude served uh, total for about 10 years. He served as a co juror under Benitez uh, for a couple of years. Don Wimberley came, and <clears throat> he did two really Im uh, important things. One was, I think he guided us through the, di the division. He let us talk about it, but he held us together. Like, so instead of kind of putting all of the discussion about sexuality in the back, he's like, we're going to talk about it, but this is how we're going to do this. And we're going to be both uh, a member of the Anglican Communion and a member of the Episcopal Church. So you can see kind of that tradition uh, of, uh, of the diocese moving us through that time period. Uh, I think uh, the other thing is that he uh, tried to sell the hospital as Ben had tried. Um, they tried to sell the hospital uh, five times, I think, uh, and were, were unable to. Uh, Bishop Wimberley was the last one to try and sell the St. Luke's Hospital. They decided not to, and they expanded it onto three or four campuses, three campuses plus clinics uh, and doctor's offices uh, across the city of Houston. So those were two really big pieces for him. He helped to renew the, the seminary. So. Uh, he, 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 believe it or not, he only served for five years, which is kind of hard to imagine. He was with us as a, as a bishop assisting in Tyler for a couple of years. So that's part of it, is that we've known it, we knew him for a while when he became bishop. Now, then you all elected me. And so I've been your bishop for 13 years. 
uh, which is weird to think about. I mean, like, because I was Bishop Wimberley's canon, right? I was his chaplain, if you will, his assistant, chief operating officer, whatever you want to call that. And um, it's weird to think about having served longer than him. And then Bishop Payne was my bishop. I mean, he's really the one. Ben sent me to seminary, but most of my time I served on it. So it's hard to think about serving longer than than Bishop Payne, too. And in a few years, I will have served longer than both of them. So it's, it's just kind of a strange, we're in an interesting period in my own ministry, having been with you. And during our time, we have planted uh, 18 new congregations. We went from six college campuses to 21. Uh, we have 80 small church, uh, small missional communities. Now, we think that number's probably gone down over the pandemic. So we're, we've, we've hired somebody to kind of help us figure out uh, what's going on there. But we think that'll come back uh, uh, as we move forward. And we're getting ready to plant three churches uh, this next year, despite the pandemic. And uh, we have uh, Sudanese, Indian, Spanish-speaking congregations, as well as our English-speaking congregations uh, during my tenure. So we've also expanded that beyond just uh, the, the Spanish-speaking uh, churches. Uh, and um, we have created a foundation, two foundations, one to help plant congregations, uh, the Great Commission Foundation, which has a hundred million in it, and, uh, well, a hundred and, it has, it has a hundred and forty million in it now, uh, and the um, Episcopal Health Foundation, which has uh, one point six billion dollars in it and uh, those two foundations were created because uh, i transitioned the hospital we we did not have the capacity to continue to run a, we had no business running a hospital uh, and uh, in this era as a church and we were unwilling i felt as a diocese to continue to put assets all in one place in the city of houston when we had 57 counties uh, to minister to so today, as of today, this is an interesting thing, uh, Episcopalians make up 0.5% of the population in the 57 counties and 46,000 square miles, 0.5%. We, we are the largest Episcopal church diocese in the country, regard, it doesn't matter what you look at, numbers of people attending, churches, uh, and uh, uh, money, I mean, average Sunday attendance, whatever you want to look at, we've got more. Um, because it is a competition. No, it's, it's not a competition. <laughs> it might be a little competition, but that's on me. That's my sinful nature, uh, not the diocese. Um, it's just we work well together. Um, <laughs> so, uh, but we have 0.5% of, of the people. Uh, we have not measured yet your outreach in the churches. Like, so we don't know how many lives, we know how many lives are, you, you touch any given week in terms of worship, but we don't know how many lives you touch in terms of your outreach. Like, we want to measure that, and we're going to measure it. We just have, we have never measured it. But even without measuring the church's outreach, but taking into consideration some large outreach, like there's some very large pro-Trinity center in, Austin and St. David. So we took into consideration some of those. We influenced the lives of 17% of the population through good work in this diocese. So 0.5% impacts over 17%. It's going to be more than that, right? Because we haven't yet counted the outreach ministries of each congregation and how many lives those people touch. That's an amazing thing. And I think it helps us to see that we continue as a diocese that thrives in mission uh, through evangelism and church planting and new congregations, but we also thrive in service to our fellow human being. And, and those, those, those together, I think, continue the great tradition of the Episcopal Church uh, in the Diocese of Texas. So I think we're going to do questions. Yes, questions. Yes. Oh, yes. Uh huh. Yep. Yes. It is. 
Yes, we provide the majority, we're one of the largest donors to the Anglican Communion Office, the Diocese of Texas, to Anglican Communion Office, as well as to foreign mission in a lot of different ways. The Diocese of Texas has relationships with missionaries and dioceses in over 46 different countries uh, around the world. Uh, we have two, uh, three specific ones, uh, Southern Malawi uh, and uh, Costa Rica. Um, we have an internal one, which is um, South Dakota. So, um, but we have these, these big relationships. So yeah, Joanne happens, she's not here today, she happens to be, she goes to the cathedral, but today she is greeting the Bishop of Tanzania who happens to be there while I'm with, with you all. Yeah. What other questions? Yes. It was Bishop Quint. A lot of people think of Bishop Hines having that. Bishop Hines supervised the building of it, but Bishop Quinn founded it. We did. We sold it in 2000 and, well, process began in 2010, and we sold it in 2012 for $1.3 billion. It is. It's called, it's not called St. Luke's Episcopal. It's called St. Luke's. Now it, it's, it was bought by a bunch of nuns in the Roman Catholic Church, uh, Catholic Health Initiatives, but they've since turned it over to a couple of other organizations. So it's still called St. Luke's, but not Episcopal. Yeah. It is where I go. It is our hospital. But uh, it uh, doesn't belong to us anymore. And they needed about a billion dollars worth of infrastructure, which the diocese wasn't going to provide. But as part of the sale, CHI guaranteed building a new hospital, etc. They had a lot of things they needed to do. They needed to deal with town and the town and gown issue, electronic records, uh, the doctors were all aging quickly uh, with no young doctors. They couldn't, couldn't get a relationship with a uh, uh, medical school down there done uh, despite their efforts. And when I looked at all of those things and the fact that all of those things were true when I was canon to the ordinary under Bishop Wimberly and they had been unable for 10 years to resolve that, it made me, it was like really clear that in the changing medical world, we should not own a hospital. If we can't actually get that done, we have no business doing it. By doing that, they now have early, I helped, uh, and they now have a relationship with Baylor College of Medicine, they have young doctors, I mean, all of that stuff has happened uh, because of it. So, you know, the good news is most everybody stayed working there, and uh, whereas if we had sold the Methodists, I think they would have gutted the hospital and put their own people there. So, I think it was kind of the best. And, we're pumping $35 million into health ministry across the Diocese of Texas every year. $35 million into clinics, vaccinations, family health. <laughs> I mean, you name it, we're having this huge impact all across our 57. We're providing scholarships so that people can participate in the counseling, Christian counseling program at Seminary of the Southwest. And then to, to, to receive that scholarship, then they go to East Texas to provide counseling. So in a, in a place that, you know, Austin has something like, I don't know, five counselors for every thousand people. I don't know, something like that, some crazy number. And, you know, East Texas has one, maybe. So now we, and we actually have people, we were sending people out to do therapy and counseling in East Texas. We never would have had that kind of impact. So today we're reaching many more people and continuing, I think, the health ministry of the diocese. And you might ask, you know, if you were to get a billion dollars today, would you put it in a hospital? Probably not. If you really wanted to impact the lives of people on the ground across your diocese, you wouldn't put it all in one place, in one city, where everybody had to go. You'd try and spread it out. And that's what we did with it. Yeah. Yes. Um, at the beginning, 
the Diocese of Texas uh, helped by by working, I would say that they worked to help make the other two dives, but after that, they were kind of on their own. So Northwest Texas comes out of the missionary ter territory of North Texas, right? So Dallas began to form, then Northwest Texas. It became really clear those were two different places uh, and uh, had different identities, which I think is true. Uh, and so that really comes out of the Dallas, North Texas. We didn't have much to do with that. <clears throat> we were already on our own, doing our own thing. They, but we are the mother diocese. So they, they all, we, we like to send letters to them. Dear daughter diocese, we hope you're doing well. You know, so, and, and they like to remind me that I'm not the bishop of Texas, but just a bishop in Texas. You know, so we have a little, we have a little thing. I'm like, yeah, good luck with that. Uh, um, we have been very supportive since the conflict in uh, the Diocese of Fort Worth, Scott Mayer, the bishop there, is a very dear friend. He's part of my class. He and I became bishops at the same year. And we continue to support uh, them in a lot of different ways. Um, and we have financially supported them previously, though we are not sending them any funds right now. Um, I'm very interested in what happens. We need a diocese in Fort Worth. Uh, and we need a healthy Northwest Texas. Yes, two more, two more. I'm gonna take the young man first. Yes, I have, why do I have big sleeves? I have small sleeves, first of all. But you will only know that if you look at pictures of other bishops who have giant sleeves. I mean, when we were found, I mean, the Bishop of, of the Bishop Greg picture I have, I mean, he's like practically, he's like peeking out of a giant marshmallow. His sleeves are so big. I mean, it's like, Oh, like, you know, like you've dressed up like I've got giant sleeves. And so the, uh, and these continue, the sleeves, there are two things that have changed in the bishops. One is their sleeve. The sleeves have become much smaller. And when I got my first sleeves, I actually sent them to the seamstress and said, these are too big. So I, I evidently don't have a tolerance for, I'm going to be like, I'd just be waving them around all the time, probably take off from flapping. The second thing is the smile. So the first bishops, of course, because of photography, right? You, it's, it's really has to do with the, but the first bishops all were like this. But slowly you get these smiles. And one, one old priest said, we were just chatting, looking at the pictures and said, someday the next bishop, and I hadn't had my picture done, he said the next bishop, is going to be laughing. It's going to be like, that's the trajectory of these smiles. So, so if you look at my picture, I'm not smiling. I was like, okay, I'm just going to kind of like a small grin, maybe. So smaller sleeves, small grin. That's what I am right there. Yes, good question. <laughs> what, can you name one thing that's given you joy in the Yeah, I'm, well, I'll just, the most obvious is this. I mean, being with people... I get to be, every Sunday, I get to be with people who are choosing the Episcopal Church. Think about that. Every Sunday, I'm with people who are choosing. I've come to, listen to the lesson today. I continue the ministry of laying hands and praying for the Holy Spirit on people who join our church. That's what I get to do. Or young people who have grown up in our church. These, these are the things that I get to do. I get to be with people who are excited about the Episcopal Church. Uh, I love what we've accomplished. And that makes, that's great happiness. Uh, we've worked really hard together and we're not done. I, I, I'm looking forward to council and announcing some new initiatives. I mean, and we've, we've stayed together, uh, we've survived, we've built, rebuilt houses during the hurricanes and fires. We have, we have answered the call to ministry and that makes me happy. But every Sunday I get to come and be with people and that makes me happy uh, because it's just joyful. The most senior priests in the Diocese of Texas. 
you get the last word, Father. Sir. I'm going to stand up because I want to be heard. You've written several wonderful books, but I believe that the head of the law, the height of Jesus. Yes. Uh, if we would share the original impetus, inspiration, incident, whatever it was, in your life in the church, from your point of view, clinical as it may be. For the Jesus heist. What, uh, is it still around, this heist? Yeah, somebody wrote me the other day a very angry letter about it. <laughs> yeah. The Jesus Science is a book, basically all the books I write have to do with questions I get, right? So they come out of and are part of my teaching ministry actually here in the Diocese of Texas. And as we looked at kind of recapturing our missionary spirit, people would say, well, if we don't add people to our church, what, why do we even do it? That's not evangelism. Evangelism is a sharing of Christ and the transformation of lives. If they happen to come to church, that's a great thing. That's like bonus. But the goal isn't to get them in the pew. The goal is to tell them about Jesus Christ and his grace. Amen. That's our work. And so if we don't actually do that, it doesn't matter. You get a lot of people in your pew and you won't have made a difference in their life. You have to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ and grace. And if you're not doing that, we're not a church. And I got tired of people saying, why are we doing this? And what I wanted to point out is that actually the whole history, both our, our tradition within uh, the Jewish faith and Jesus' ministry and the church was one where that's what we took on, was, was going out. So Jesus Christ is really about going out and as Christians then proclaiming the gospel. Okay, I'm going to end on that because I have to go get ready. Thank you all very much.